I'm here to introduce these amazing poets who have been shaping uh, poetry, really, in America and the region in particular uh, for quite some time. Um, but before I do that, I am, didn't realize there would be so many people here, but everybody has paper anyways. So I'm going to send these around, and if you have questions that you would like to send up here, um, please send them to me. I'll be sitting right here, so just sort of like pass them until they eventually get to me, which I know, I'm sorry, it makes you guys very responsible for these questions as well. I've, I'm recruiting you as collaborators. Um, so could you just sort of pass those around? Um, okay, so sorry that we don't have a mic. Uh, Okay, so uh, this po oh, sorry, this panel is on, it's called Innovations from Here, and we have decided that these are the innovative poets we're going to present to you, right? Um, <laughs> and um, so I'm going to start with Joanne Kiger here, um, who has so many books that she's written, and I will not give a Wikipedia introduction on your biographies at all. That's been done already. I looked up all your Wikipedia entries, and I decided not to use them. Um, but, uh, but Joanne doesn't remember this, but we've met once every decade, so I'm going to try and keep that going. notes, I think she might have had a note about it. Yeah. Um, so Joanne is coming from Bolinas, which is one of the most beautiful places in all of the world and somehow has remained absolutely pristine. Um, and my next door neighbor. <laughs> and uh, she was sort of like in a poetry crew, if you could call it that, um, in the 50s and 60s um, in San Francisco and Berkeley. Um, and this is George Stanley, this fine gentleman here. Um, he's living in Vancouver right now, and he was from San Francisco, but loved it so much he went to Vancouver and decided to kick it there. And one of the things I love a lot about George Stanley's work is he writes poems about baseball, and they're actually awesome. And it's very rare to find a poet there are poems about baseball that you're like, whoa, this is a good poem. This is really amazing. Yeah, so, right, right, yeah. Um, and, um. The old guy Wayne. Oh, yeah, that's right. The old guy Wayne. Oh, yeah, right. We could. And one of the things I think many people uh, tend to know about George Stanley is that he also used to kick it with the same crew of poets in San Francisco. And um, I think. I was first introduced to your work by a lawyer. She bought me a book at St. Mark's Poetry Book. She's like, you should check this poet out. I was like, whatever, OK. And then I was like, ooh, it was baseball poems. <laughs> <laughs> and this is Jean Huey, who hails from the faraway land of Bothell. Um, she actually lives in Seattle, though, but she works at Bothell and has done phenomenal work in the city to keep poetry going, um, particularly innovative poetry. And she's just launched an MFA program at uh, UW Bothell, which is amazing. So any of you students think about MFA programs, you should most definitely think about that one. Um, and this gentleman I've just recently met and become acquainted with his work in the last year, Stephen Collis, who is known as a poet and activist and uh, I read something about you picking blackberries on Vancouver Island as a kid, um, which was really interesting, um, and growing up in Vancouver. Uh, so this is the panel that we're going to... <laughs> He's still growing up, actually. He we decided he's still growing up. Growing up. <laughs> yeah. um, and the last thing I just want to say is that I am truly humbled and absolutely nervous to be up here with these poets. I mean, these are legendary poets that we get to see here, and we're really lucky that they all came to Seattle, um, especially Jean. It was a really far trip for her. <laughs> Who was born here? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so we're really lucky to have them here with us um, to talk to us about uh, innovative poetry in the region and whatnot. So thank you. And I'll leave, leave it up to Joanne. around. 
Okay, Paul Nelson asked if I would speak a little bit uh, about my time in San Francisco, now that I have a really mature history uh, of the late 50s um, and what it was like. Um, I had finished school in Santa Barbara, where I had studied uh, Williams, Elliot, and Pound with a teacher named Hugh Kenner. Ezra Pound wasn't really being taught in the United States uh, during the 50s. Uh, and then I came up to San Francisco when I finished school in 1957 where I discovered uh, this thing called the San Francisco Renaissance uh, going on. It wasn't really a school. Uh, there was all kinds of poets writing all kinds of poetry, um, of really energetic poetry. The uh, Sixth Gallery reading it happened. Snyder, Ginsburg, so forth, had introduced themselves in 56, the year before I got there. I soon learned in 57 that uh, everyone said, oh, you should have been here last year. That was really what was happening. <laughs> but nonetheless, there was enough happening for me to feel like this is my real school, that other stuff, the academic. And it was a fun school. Uh, there was poetry with jazz. It was a very vibrant, swinging thing. This energy of the San Francisco Renaissance had uh, come from what was called the Berkeley Renaissance of the late 40s, whose members included Robert Duncan, Jack Spicer, Robin Glazer, Josephine Miles, James Broughton, Don Allen, and Warren and Ellen Coleman, who in 1956 moved to Vancouver, where uh, Warren taught at UBC and brought poets to the Vancouver Poetry Conference in 1963. So you can see the origins of San Francisco going up to Vancouver, and I guess it's the trickle-down theory that comes eventually to Seattle. Um, San Francisco was, in 57, was like finding, as I said before, a real school. Everything was happening. The Howell trial, trial was going on. Uh, I read On the Road, somebody gave me a copy of On the Road while a friend drove me in his car up to the Russian River and I was so excited reading the book that I didn't even look where I was going, I just kept reading the book and looking out the window occasionally at the Redwoods. Um, after I'd been working in San Francisco for a few months, a friend took me to uh, North Beach uh, where it was all really happening at this place called The Place. Um, a, famous writers and poets bar run by Leo Krikorian, who had been a student at Black Mountain College. Uh, beer was 25 cents a glass. Um, at that point, Jack Spicer's White Rabbit Press was coming out, and I remember, should I buy the book for 25, they were 25 cents, should I buy the book for 25 cents or buy the beer for 25 cents? <laughs> um, and this, uh, see, blah, 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 Black Mountain College in North Carolina had just closed the year before, and uh, which brought a group of really young writers who then came and formed a group of, uh, Robert Duncan had been teaching there, who formed a, uh, a group of writer, a group around uh, Robert Duncan and Jack Spicer, and they were John Wieners, Joe Dunn, Michael Rumaker, Ebba Beauregard, and Tom Field and Paul Alexander Painters from Black Mountain, also George Stanley from San Francisco, Harold and Dora Dahl, Russell Fitzgerald from Pennsylvania, and David Meltzer from Venice. And soon myself, when I was invited to the Sunday afternoon poetry group that Spicer and Duncan were, quote, teaching. We usually met at the Joe Dunn's apartment then in the afternoon, then uh, John Wieners, and then George Stanley's. And they usually went like this. Jack and Robert would read whatever current work they were writing. Sometimes Robert would be writing a poem while Jack was reading. <laughs> <laughs> Often Jack's poems would be addressed to someone in the group, some of whom had been in his magic workshop class earlier in that spring of 1957. Then the young writers would read whatever they had written. And Jack and Duncan were, quote, the judges. Jack was a serious listener, and the poem could be read two or three times. Does this sound true 
there had to be obedience to this thing called the poem. And the poem had its own validity, its own demands, the poem. One must never sell out poetry, make money off it. The most sarcastic comment from Spicer would be, you could publish that in the New Yorker. <laughs> much of a, of a private life, unlike Duncan or Glazer, the relationship with his students was very intense and special. Of course, one had to hang in there, and the terrain was fraught with late night danger, staying up till the bar is closed, finding out the truth of a poem. Duncan was a little less demanding, and I quote George Stanley, I think we could expect what we considered more of a fair hearing from Duncan than from Spicer. Like Duncan was much more willing to allow for the possibility of, being, of there being something there. And Spicer was much more willing to allow for the possibility of there being nothing there. <laughs> Just shit. <laughs> Spicer was a harder crap. crap. You said yeah. shit in this interview. Oh yeah, well Jack's word was crap. crap. <laughs> That sounds better, doesn't it? <laughs> That's crap. Right. So, uh, quote, Spicer was a harder judge. Quote, still quoting. So, George says, so your life was on the line, your poem was on the line, and that was your life that week. Uh, David Meltzer, who was involved in the poetry and jazz scene at the cellar in North Beach, where Rex Roth and Pearl and Getty were recorded reading poetry to jazz and did it every week or so once wrote a rather long and somewhat undisciplined piece. One poem was so long it was glued end to end and he had to stand on a chair to read it. When he turned it over to read the other side, Jack and Robert rushed forward and set the bottom of the page on <laughs> These poems were very lively with large amounts of gallon red wine being consumed in whatever containers were available, jars, saucepans, etc. I remember drinking some out of a little poached egg pan. Then I was told by George Stanley that some people are just coming here and treating this like a party. That was me and my friend Nemi Frost from Santa Barbara. <laughs> Spicer was always saying, you can take a girl out of Santa Barbara, but you can't take Santa Barbara out of a girl. <laughs> These poetry occasions were not to be considered frivolously. If I was to participate, I would have to read my poems. So I did, and I passed. Spicer, in a letter to Robin Blazer, then in Boston, says, don't search for the perfect poem. Let your way of writing of the moment go along its own path explore and retreat, but never be fully confined within the boundaries of one poem. There really is no single poem. Poems should echo and re-echo against each other. They should create resonances. They cannot live alone any more than we can. A poem is never to be judged by itself alone. A poem is never by itself alone written one after another, they belong together inside a book. They whisper sweet things to each other at night when the book is closed. They're like his family, his children. And he ends this letter by saying, this is the most important letter you have ever received. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a few years ago, um, a, a series of books called Lost and Found started to be reissued people from the center, the graduate center of the City <coughs> University of New York, CUNY, went into the archives and found all these letters that had been tucked away for scholars and so forth, and brought them out um, in um, a very interesting <coughs> series. And one of the books is, see it's got little wine stains on it already. Uh, <laughs> letters to and from Joanne Kiger, and I'll read a couple of little excerpts from here. We had a class in the San Francisco library with Spicer and Duncan. Duncan's class met last night and more talk about vowels and consonants. The boredom of it 
to me relieved only by the fact that Robert arrived quite high on martinis. <laughs> Afterwards, Spicer, Duncan, Ebba, George Stanley, Joe Dunn, and I walked through the Broadway tunnel to the place. Spicer on the anti-beatnik Book of the Month Club side, and Joe, Robert, Duncan, and I forming a new faction, the Dharma Committee. And that's from a little book called the Dharma Committee Notes. At the Dunn's Poetry Reading yesterday, the White Rabbit Press, no one came except Nemi, Jerome, Tom Field, and I. So we drank ale and used the hula hoop, also practiced Zen lotus positions, and took Dada photographs. Then we ran to the bread and wine mission, but on passing the place, Sheila ran out and said, Leo will buy a bottle of champagne if you come in. We did, and he did, very small. Then he bought drinks for the house, and then a large gallon of wine. Joe gave him a life membership to the White Rabbit Press publications, which Leo, drunk, tore up before he read. <laughs> then Carolyn, Tom, and I went to the bread and wine mission for dinner and heard Bob Kaufman read poems. The young minister watching us with usual face, concentrated interest. These are famous times, I'm sure. October 27th, went to Duncan's poetry class at the SF Library. Jack Spicer wrote a poem with a bass in hidden diphthongs reading out Joanne Kiger has ringworm. <laughs> <laughs> July 59. Spicer introduced me to Joanne Lowe at Vesuvio's yesterday as the Alger Hiss of Zen Buddhism. <laughs> Jack Spicer organizes Zen singing at the place. Zen was very much in the air right then. He realizes the Dharma Committee is fully committed in its momentary, momentary direction. He realizes he has a school of singing and wastes no time in getting touch, in touch with Tom Parkinson at UC Berkeley and invites him to come hear his protégés perform at Blabbermouth night. We have rehearsed whenever we felt like it such tunes as Give me some Zen, who are start, how did Zen? <laughs> and when it rains, it always rains, Zennies from heaven. <laughs> and other free form groan sounds in large, loud cacophony. However, when called upon to perform for Professor Parkinson on Blabbermouth night, his students balk and shyly refuse to perform for the academy on some grounds or other, probably lack of free beer. Thus ends an era of Zen singing. <laughs> and I'll close with a few little quotes from Jack when he went up to earlier in 1949 when he was wrote for Occident magazine. He was a part of a symposium, a transcription of which was published, which is he asked, Who is listening to us? It is not modern poetry. It is not that modern poetry does not make sense. It is that is not entertaining. And after listening to the beer slam last night, I could see that that did have an audience. <laughs> Poetry, when it is removed from a living audience, loses its form, becomes puzzling. Today, we are not singers. We would rather publish poetry in little magazines than read it in a large hall. If we do read in a large hall, we do not take the most elementary steps to make our poetry vivid and entertaining. We are not singers. We do not use our bodies. We recite from a printed page. We must regain our voices. We must become singers, become entertainers. We must stop sitting on the pot of culture. And close with a quote from the, the Vancouver lecture. Try to keep all of yourself that is possible out of the poem. And whenever there's a line that you like particularly well, which expresses just how you're feeling this particular moment, which seems just lovely, then be so goddamn suspicious of it that you wait for two or three hours before you put it down on paper. <laughs> and I asked uh, Paul, with his beautiful voice, if he would read this final poem by, uh, not the final poem of Jack Spicer's, but a poem of Jack Spicer's, in which he really presents the geography of himself, which he encompasses all of California. <laughs> 
It's called Psychoanalysis and Elegy. An Elegy, 1956. What are you thinking about? I'm thinking of an early summer. I'm thinking of wet hills in the rain, pouring water, shedding it down empty acres of oak and manzanita, down to the old green brush <coughs> tangled in the sun, greasewood, sage, and spring mustard, or the hot wind coming, coming down from Santa Ana, driving the hills crazy, a fast wind with a bit of dust in it, bruising everything and making the seed sweet. We're down in the city where the peach trees are awkward as young horses and there are kites caught on the wires up above the street lamps and the storm drains are all choked with dead branches. What are you thinking? I think that I would like to write a poem that is slow as a summer, as slow as getting started, as 4th of July somewhere around the middle of the second stanza, after a lot of unusual rain. California seems long in the summer. I would like to write a poem as long as California and as slow as summer. Do you get me, doctor? It would have to be as slow as the very tip of summer, as slow as the summer seems on a hot day drinking beer outside Riverside, or standing in the middle of a white hot road between Bakersfield and hell waiting for Santa Claus. <laughs> what are you thinking now? <coughs> I'm thinking that she is very much like California. When she is still, her dress is like a road map, highways traveling up and down her skin, long, empty highways with the moon chasing jackrabbits across them on hot summer nights. I am thinking that her body could be California, and I, a rich eastern tourist, lost somewhere between hell and Texas, looking at a map of a long, wet, dancing California that I have never seen. Send me some penny picture postcards, lady. Send them. One of each breast photograph looking like curious national monuments. One of your body sweeping like a three-lane highway, 27 miles from a night's lodging in the world's oldest hotel. What are you thinking? I'm thinking of how many times this poem will be repeated. How many summers will torture California until the damned maps burn, until the mad cartographer fail, falls to the ground and possesses the sweet, thick earth from which he has been hiding. What are you thinking now? I am thinking that a poem could go on forever. summary of those years in, in San Francisco rings true. I, as, as, she was, as she was speaking, I, other terrible things that happened arose in my mind. I, <laughs> uh, when you said that uh, one of Jack, Jack's great put-downs was to say that you could publish that poem in the New Yorker. Uh, I was in New York, New York a few years ago, and I met Alice Quinn, the poetry editor of the New Yorker, and she asked me to send her some poems. I never did actually send them. Wow. <laughs> it's really hard to hear you. Oh, sorry. It's a beautiful voice. Yes, yeah, no, yeah. no mic. No mic. Oh, that's right. No mic. Okay. Shout. Try, I'll try to shout. That means I'll, I'll be speaking uh, less at length. <laughs> I, didn't ex I didn't expect to speak very much at length anyway. Anyway, uh, I never did send any poems to the New Yorker, but La I told, told this story about being asked this to Larry Fagan. Larry Fagan was one of us young youngins in San Francisco in, <clears throat> in the 60s, but, this, but he had moved to New York. He's, Larry said to me, oh, if you're going to publish a poem in the New Yorker, it has to have a sailboat in it. <laughs> Okay, innovation, the, the two terms that have been proposed to us to, to talk about are innovation and Cascadia. I'm not going to say anything about Cascadia right this moment, maybe something a bit later on. But innovation, it certainly sounds like a 19th century word. <laughs> I mean, you can, you can practically see the wheels turning in it. 
But actually, I looked it up in the OED, and it's a 16th century word. It's one of those words that came into English, the great flood of Latinisms in the Renaissance. If you strip the word of its accretions, if you take off the intensive in at the front and the, and the substantive ation at the end, you have NOV, which, as everyone knows, is Latin for new. So what I'm going to talk about for just a few minutes is uh, what has, what, when has the term new been important in modern poetry, specifically modern English language poetry. And the first moment is famous quotation of Ezra Pound, make it new. Ezra Pound also, in, in addressing uh, Walt Whitman, and I don't have this, I may not be quoting this exactly, he said to Whitman, you have cut the new wood, now it is time for carving. <laughs> So if Whitman had cut the new wood, if what Whitman had done was new, would Ezra Pound's carving also be new? I think the answer is yes. <laughs> we, we may get into what, what, what that means. Uh, but when, when Pound and Eliot and H.D. and uh, other poets of the, of the first decade of the 20th century uh, spoke, said that poetry ought to be new. New in respect to what? New in, in respect to, to the terrible state that poetry ha had gotten into in the long decline from, Roman of Romantic from Romanticism of Romanticism in the 19th century. Uh, not only was it, it was all of course rhymed and metered and, uh, and it was all very sentimental, and, and there was so much of it. I mean, uh, there were many, many poets, and, they, and every year they were publishing huge collections of their, of their poetry, mostly nature poetry, mostly sentimental poetry, uh, which had lost all of the of the uh, excitement of, of, of the Romantic poets, say, 80 years previously, Shelley and Keats and Coleridge. So that's what, that's what Pound was and Eliot were arg was arguing against. We have to have something new. And of course, they weren't alone. In the early part of the, of the uh, 20th century, the same thing was happening in painting, where uh, Picasso and Matisse also looked back and saw everything as being, you know, even though the, the I, I don't want to get too far into this because I'm not a history, art historian, but even though the Impressionists were quite new in their own day, looking back at them, Picasso and Matisse, Matisse sort, of saw, sort of saw them all as part of the same school as classical painting, Angra. Uh, also true in music, Stravinsky, also true in dance, Nijinsky, etc. So there was a whole movement of making the arts new at that time, and it was all, in a sense, reacting against a, a, a kind of a stasis, a tedium, uh, and an oversupply of, of bad art in the late, late 19th century. Okay, so the second time that this word new comes up is with Don Allen's anthology, uh, The New American Poetry, um, which by the way in its second, in its second edition was, was titled The Postmoderns, which is an absolute misnomer. Mm -hmm. The poets in the New American Poetry were not postmodern at all, they were modernists. Uh, the subtitle, or the, or the, the full title of Don Allen's anthology is The New American Poetry, 1945 to 60. And this is something that isn't usually recognized. You think of, the, of all these poets as though they suddenly rose up in the 1950s and, and began writing. It's not true. What Don Allen was, in his anthology, was, was uh, opposing or was, was trying to make, take a stand against was what we would have called academic poetry. That is, poetry was dominated by 
Uh, rhyme and meter had come back to some extent too. But it was dominated by a poetry that was pretty much written, written for the critics. Uh, George Bowering said to me last night, quote, a typical uh, comment of the time, except I think that he saw this comment in print uh, sometime currently, which was that this poet, who uh, he or she, the critic, critic said, had lost control of her material. <laughs> and, and it was that attitude of poets not having control of their material, not living up to the critical standards that were <coughs> imposed by, uh, they weren't creative writing departments at the time, uh, English departments who were also listening to the, with that group of critics called the New Critics. It was all academic, and it was all very recent. 1945, the war is over. 1960, we're, uh, we're all rebelling against something that's only been around about 10 years. Uh, the point that I wanted to make about the 1945-1960 is that these poets who were in the, the volume, the New American Poet, Poetry, they were, had all been fairly well known for at least 10 years and maybe longer in their communities. Um, Charles Olson, John Wieners, and others in Boston, uh, Spicer, Blazer, and Duncan in San Francisco, the poets at, at Black Mountain College, but they weren't getting into the university cu curricula, and they, and, uh, and they weren't published by the major publishers, etc. So it was a kind of a, a, there was again, there was the newness about all these poets. Oh, I, I should have also mentioned a couple of New York poets, uh, Frank O'Hara and John Ashbery. Uh, these were all new poets, but they were new in respect to something that had, that they felt unsatisfactory, uh, just unsatisfactory. So if we fast forward to the present, and if, if and this is a kind of a, of an of a, argument based upon analogy. Are we at the same point now? If we ask, um, that poetry be new again, if, we, if, we're, if, we're, if we're making this argument that poetry should make it new again, there's really, there's really two questions. One is, what are the poetic values of those who would claim or, or who would want to make a new poetry? I have a short answer to that, but I'm not going to give it right now. It'll come up in one of the questions. Uh, I mean, it's a, there could be many, many possible answers to that question. What are, the, what are their poetic values? And the other question is, what would it be new in reaction against? What are the qualities of most poetry today that would lead some poets to say, we have to make it new in reaction against that character of, of contemporary poetry? That question, I think, has to be answered if you want to talk about innovation at the present time. Uh, so that's, that's what I had to say. But I also want to read one other quote uh, from Jack Spicer, of course, uh, because and I ask you about whether there's a contradiction here, because going back to pounds make it new, here's a quotation from Spicer. Tradition means generations of different poets in different countries patiently telling the same story, writing the same poem, gaining and losing something with each transformation, but of course not really losing anything. So the last question I'll leave you with is, is there any conflict between making it new and being true to tradition? And again, I would say the answer is no. <laughs> papers and uh, comments, and uh, my remarks are uh, perhaps a little more sketchy. Um, more sketchy than mine? Uh, you had a regular thesis going there. <laughs> so um, 
In thinking about this panel, I was interested in the title, Innovations from Here. And sort of here, what does here mean? Uh, particularly as I announced, I'm actually from here, I'm actually from Seattle. And initially when being asked to talk in this panel, I thought, well, what exactly do you have to say? What exactly would be your contributions? And I thought, well, I'm actually from here. So in fact, innovations from here, Seattle, um, is a very interesting question, which would be a very long autobiography on my part. So I'm simply going to highlight some of those aspects of being from here that may be of interest to people in this room. So I was very interested in the McCloskey talk and the notion of Cascadia, which is a new idea as a, a geo-origin. Um, what he was talking about is interesting. But from a very early age, I had a sense that the boundaries that were crossing through our territories, namely the Washington State, Oregon, and the boundary up to Canada, actually, I had this very strong impression, actually kept me from wanting to be from here. And I think if you're from a non-metropolitan center and you're interested in the arts, that is like a really important part of actually being from here. What does it mean to practice an art from a metropolitan center that is not New York, that is not Los Angeles, and that may not be San Francisco or Vancouver either? So, um, so what is here? Here is a divided landscape. It is Vancouver, it's British Columbia, it's Washington, it's Oregon, California. Um, what is here? Um, it is Cascadia, and for me, I would say the West Coast would have been my biogeographical region. Uh, what is here socio-historically? It is feminism for me and its discontents. Uh, it is Black Mountain New American poetry as something to be recaptured and re-understood. It is language poetry and its discontent, its fellow travelers, and the constant backbiting of all experimental poetry scenes. Um, and in current, currently, as we've created a program in poetics at the University of Washington Bothell, it is cross-media and cross-art. So, the, so these are kind of the here's that I'm engaged by and which I can find my history in if I were to bore you with a more long autobiography of myself. Um, Okay, um, me in Seattle, and I started out by suggesting that what does it do, mean to be a writer um, or an artist in a metropolitan center which is not itself the center, okay? And I think one of the things that would come out in all of the, the narratives that we might tell about poetry is indeed the very important sense of being part of a group or a community of poets and writers that exists for the poetry and the writing, not for the academic acclaim, not for the specific kinds of publications, but indeed that the group itself is generative. So for me, immediately, the here was very importantly moving San Francisco, Portland, Seattle, Vancouver. Um, but the here is also, for me, very much Seattle, and it's very much trying to kind of find one's way as a much younger poet, not recognizing which scene is the scene for me, or which scene I want to be a part of, or even noting that I necessarily would benefit by finding people that I would find more location and definition and exploration with. Um, I think that's a really important definition for many artists and poets that get born into the non-centers of art and poetry. And I was really taken with the statement that John Yao, New York poet, said, I uh, broadcast well because New York poets said it, John Yao said that he found in his travels throughout the United States 
that was really interesting to him was how the same things would be generating and bubbling up at different places. The same stuff that was in New York, that was new in New York. So what that idea brought to mind was indeed the ways that those febrile, the, the new generations that may be happening at any one place get broadcast elsewhere. And so it made me think, well, what, what is here? What is Seattle? What can you recognize retrospectively? And again, I would get into a much longer autobiography that might not interest, but I think the reference to Wobblies and Marx's culture in Seattle for me was extremely important uh, in terms of who I hung out with when I was in my 20s. Okay, so that group was not a particularly arts or poetry group, but it was a group that was very counter-cultural. And the connections, many of these friends of mine, looking retrospectively, had wobbly parents. They were red diaper babies. Uh, they lived on Waldron Island. There is a whole kind of counterculture community here that I just connected up with, and I sat in my corner and wrote poems and writing, and they kind of looked at it and thought it was kind of interesting. And we all conspired together to be something other than the place we were from. So the other thing I would say is that this message came newly home to me. I decided to read Kurt Cobain's journals. Uh, he was born in Aberdeen, Washington. And I simply got interested in his story and I wanted to kind of see where he came from. And one of the really interesting things to me was that the whole grunge movement came from, one, finding a, a person in music, and I'm not remembering his name right well, that was really exciting to him, to them. And he came from that location, Olympia and Aberdeen. And that was the connection for them to start doing something different. So it was from here. The other thing that I noticed in reading his journals was that they were constantly act, reacting against the commercial music industry, even though they eventually entered it big time. But that whole sense of reaction was indeed two-pronged. One, it was intellectual, thoughtful, artistic. We're against that. On the other hand, it was very personal. We're from this muddy, rainy little town called Aberdeen, and we are nobody. We'll never make it. We're nothing. We're trying to make it. We can't get our band to Seattle. We lost our drummer. So it was, so I really recognize, oddly enough, even though my world is very different than Kurt Cobain, I recognize something in that story, the energy of not being from the Metropolitan Center. Okay, quickly, um, I got a happy story here in Seattle because um, I began to associate with a group of writers in Subtext Collective, uh, which brought new writing from Seattle and elsewhere to the city. I joined up with their reading group, and I eventually, we all put on a reading series for many years. Uh, this subtext collected, read on by Robert Minthal, Ezra Mark, Nico Valsalakis, uh, and various associated people, simply was my, sort of allowed me to breathe um, outside of rather constrained circles in a way that connected me with those circles here. You know, the, again, the here becomes very important, I think. Um, so, um, so consequently, this sort of brings us more into the present. That was the beginning of 1990. Um, again, my here is multiple communities. Um, it is right now in a book re-encountering modernism through the new American poets. So very happy to hear what George Stanley had to say. Um, my here is also taking the energy from the poetics out of Buffalo, Buffalo, the poetics out of the Bay Area, and starting a new MFA that has the word poetics. We are now discovering what is poetics in 2014. Thank you. Thank you.
Um, I just need to begin by, by acknowledging the, the uh, indigenous territories whose traditional lands were gathered on. If I was in Vancouver, where I'm from, I would know exactly whose land and be able to name them specifically. I was standing on, I don't know that actually. Duwamish. 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 Well, I'd like to acknowledge the, the Duwamish territories that were gathered upon. Um, I've sort of thrown aside the notes I wrote down. I would like to try and be really brief, and it'd be nice if we could have some time for discussion. Um, what I was going to talk about was that word innovation a bit, and a little bit about Cascadia, sort of separately and beside each other. Um, I, I'm not loving the word innovation. <laughs> um, you know, it, it, it's one counter we have for the poetry we find more interesting or challenging or edgy or whatever I want to describe it. Sometimes historically we've called that avant-garde, sometimes we've called it experimental, sometimes we've called it innovative. Especially with terms like avant-garde and innovative, there's sort of, there, there are future forward-looking terms, especially avant-garde, right? That was the idea that you were, you were way out in the future ahead of everybody already and they were going to catch up. You were going to show them where to go. Um, <coughs> Innovation uh, is a word that capitalism loves. There's not a company in this world that doesn't tell you they have innovative products, innovative services, that innovate, and governments tell us innovation is the way to go. We're going to throw all this money at these companies. They'll get really rich, but they'll innovate. Um, it's a very problematic concept. But I, I want to focus on the idea of, of futurity, of its forward lookingness, because I, this is a problematic idea, the very idea of future right now is a very precarious concept, in part because of climate change. Um, I've been thinking a lot about how climate change reminds me of growing up as a kid with the, the fear and the idea of the bomb. I grew up in a town that because there was uh, one of the only two naval bases in Canada, right? We have one on each coast. I grew up in a town where the, one of our two naval bases was. It was it's a very large uh, dry dock, actually. So everyone always said, well, we're a target for the Soviet Union because they would drop a bomb here because it's you know, you Americans would simply use our port if we needed to, because it's a really big port. Um, so, uh, they, they tested an air raid siren every, uh, probably once a week when I was a kid, it would go off in Victoria. But that really eerie, like, Rrrr. we had the talks in school about going under your desk if the bomb fell on itself. Um, it's actually the 50th anniversary of that film, Dr. Strangelot, which is a marvelous satire of, of, of the arms race and nuclear war. Um, and so I've been thinking a lot about that these days, and that idea of the doomsday device in that film, right? That the, the Russians have this thing where if you drop one bomb, all these bombs will go off and blow up the whole world, and that's, the, that's their deterrence is doomsday device. Well, now in, in the, this age of climate change and what scientists are telling us, clearly capitalism has evolved into a doomsday device. That because of what it does with fossil fuels, with the clock is ticking on, we're very close to midnight on that doomsday clock. Um, Thinking about how my aesthetics might be forward-looking is not something I'm very interested in right now. Because <laughs> um, I'm not quite sure what to look ahead to, and I think there's other directions I might want to look in. Um, I was going to say stuff like that. Now, about Cascadia. Because, <laughs> you know, Cascadia is like climate change heaven in a way. Uh, because what's going to happen here, most likely, is uh, it'll get wetter. right? That, that's what happens to us with climate change. Uh, yeah, it probably these plateaus, it'll be pretty shitty and get pretty dry too. Uh, but if you're out here on the coast, it's gonna get wetter. Um, what's probably gonna happen is a lot of other people are gonna wanna come live with us because no, not a single person is gonna live in Oklahoma or Kansas or wherever. It's uninhabitable probably in the not too distant future. So they're all gonna come here. <laughs> Cascadia is going to those livable places, but a very crowded place. Um, the other th way that uh, Cascadia is being troubled by innovation in terms of capitalism's innovation, the innovation that is probably a doomsday device because of climate change, is that um, all these companies are trying to send fossil fuels across this right now. So there, you know, Bellingham is a huge coal port, they want to expand, take way more coal out there. Vancouver has huge coal ports, they want to expand. There's a pipeline already taking tar sands bitumen, diluted bitumen, um, not even really oil, it's way worse. Uh, to Vancouver, and loaded onto super tankers in Vancouver's harbor all the time. They want to triple the size of that. They want to build a new one across northern BC to come out at Kitimat, somewhere about here. Uh, so this, our region here of Cascadia has become a web of uh, trains and pipelines taking coal and oil to the coast, uh, potentially LNG, liquid natural gas, very soon. They're starting to frack this whole area uh, and build these webs of, of, of fracking wells out, out there, and then they have to ship that out. So this region has become this 
problematic corridor where, where you know, we might not suffer so badly directly from climate change environmentally in the near future, but we're where it's getting out and uh, fucking up the rest of the world. Um, it's right through here. But we have these wonderful little pressure points where you can cause problems with that process, right? Because pipelines are narrow. It's 24 inches round. <laughs> Train lines are reasonably narrow. Uh, and this region of, of rivers and valleys and mountains is, is also makes things narrow down. Okay. So I look at this beautiful environment and I think um, about peril. Uh, but also, I'm reminded that it's a, uh, an area that has been, suffered many uh, earlier stages of colonization, of exploitation, of resource extraction, of destruction. And I want to just mention really briefly three books, um, so we can talk about both of the Cascadia, but by newer writers who might have been called in, uh, innovative, but I would call the, their work um, investigative. And it's really investigative of the relation between literary and poetic form and uh, actual material, spatial, temporal, that realm there. <laughs> so I'll start in the north and work my way down. So the first book I want to mention, it was just published last year, it's called The Place of Scraps. It's by an indigenous author, uh, Jordan Abel. He's living in the Vancouver area right now. He's, uh, he's a, a Nisca nation, which are up about here, in the very northern area of Cascadia, up in this area. So he's Nisca, and uh, he takes a text uh, produced in the early 20th century by an uh, anthropologist called Barrys Barbeau, a book called Totem Poles, yeah. uh, that, in, that is what documents the removal of all these totem poles from supposedly abandoned villages and selling them off to museums all over the world. Um, he takes that textbook, and, or that text, and he, um, he erases it and reveals a different poem from inside it. And so it's his way of reclaiming, especially around a number of poles that came from the Nisga region that are described, and, he, and Barbeau retells the stories um, that are behind the poles. And uh, for, for Jordan, who was uh, adopted out of his uh, um, traditional uh, nation, uh, it's a way of sort of finding his way back to that identity. And what I'm, I'm curious about are, are and these book, three books I'm going to try to mention really quickly, all have this character of, of trying to reclaim a kind of, what I would call common subjectivity, a way, a way of, of, of sharing identities in some way and building a more, um, uh, something that's the opposite of extraction. Mm -hmm. We've pulled everything out, pulled ourselves out too. Uh, a little book called Oilywood by a poet named Chrissy McClurk. And this poem is written uh, as a series of walks around beaches in Vancouver's harbor. Uh, and it's, uh, it juxtaposes these with all this stat, uh, all these um, statistics and data from the piping company. The main one in BC is called Kinder Morgan. Kinder was one of the Enron executives who had jumped that ship and became an oil pipeline guy. Um, the title of the Oilywood, oily. like Hollywood, but Oilywood. Because oily. Vancouver sometimes referred to as Hollywood North. There's a big film industry there. Uh, so she walks around these beaches uh, and, and, ha and thinks and contemplates about all that oil that could spill here. In fact, she goes to exactly where the pipeline reaches the harbor and walks along that beach and looks at it. Uh, but you're co she's constantly positioning herself as one individual, isolated, fragile body, its connection to water, and then the connection to this massive network of, of money making, of pipelines being turned on and off, companies buying and selling each other, this constant movement of capital and ultimately oil. And finally, so we're going north to south, we'll jump down to Portland, and I'll just mention Kai Sands' book, Remember to Wave. Uh, and what I love about this is, in very similar to the others in a sense, that it, it, the poet positions herself in a space, uh, moving through the space, thinking about and attempting to connect to a, a sense of collective or common identity, how that can be salvaged, from a space that's written over with layers and layers of exploitation and destruction. So uh, Kai's book explores uh, these expo grounds in the northern part of Portland, uh, where there was once um, a, uh, uh, an internment, Japanese internment camp was there. Uh, later it was uh, cheap housing for wartime labor, largely uh, black labor. Uh, you know, in, when you were within decades of black people not even being allowed to migrate to, to Oregon. Um, and uh, you know, later it's sort of uh, this, this decayed storage kind of uh, working class entertainment, roller derby and stuff like this kind of stuff goes on in that neighborhood. And, and she moves with a, a group of people she's collaborating with through that space, recovering that history, literally through the material bits and pieces of it that can still be found in the area. And then there's a sort of production of a collaborative poem out of that, that exercise. 
So I just want to look at, you know, highlight those as three poems, three books that are, are very reasonably recent still, uh, last five years anyhow, um, that are exploring the spa this space and the, the troubles really it's facing. Uh, it, it looks pretty pristine, but it's actually uh, been, been devastated before and they're trying to devastate it again. I think I'll stop there because I'm probably ranting for way too long. Thank you. Hopefully you wrote them down. Yes, maybe, no? Oh, the paper never made it to you? We're going to add us to the names to this one. No questions. This is beautiful. I have a question. As I'm going to ask the question to George Stanley because he sits on the panel, so sort of bridges the two nations that are cascading. And I think um, there are all sorts of things in which we share dramatically. Um, and I won't miss them. Paul did a wonderful job of that last night. But I'm wondering if there are significant differences that we'll never be able to make that area gel politically as a unit. And is it partly because our education system means that we, on the Canadian side, know more about you on the American side <laughs> than you may know about us? Oh yeah, having been both an American and a Canadian, um, it's, it's funny because I'm, <clears throat> I can get to that question, but I, I, I have another question that goes 90 degrees to that question. That is, instead of it being a north-south and east-west question, I would like to have asked Professor McCloskey this morning, and that is whether the boundary between Cascadia and the region at the east is, is similar or, or, or coincides with the boundary between the First Nations, the, 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 the coastal First Nations and the Plateau First Nations, and who met at, at uh, fairs, so to say, at places like the Dalles uh, and uh, Lytton on, on the Fraser and Hazleton on the, on, on, on the Skeena. Okay, that's, that's an, that's an east-west thing. North-south, um, Will, it's a, I guess the question is, will the, the, the dif differences between Canadians and Americans increase or will they decrease? My intuition says they'll decrease. I mean, I moved from the United States to Canada. I was very young looking, so when I got to Canada, everyone said, are you a, a draft dodger? And I really, I was, I was older than, than, than the, the, the uh, men and women who came to Canada because of the Vietnam War. Uh, but one thing about Canada to me was here was a, one of the most liberal countries on earth. And uh, we now in Canada have the most right-wing government, the, the one that is in the, in, the, in the hands of the oil and gas industry. And we look to the south and we see the great conflict here in the, in the US between liberals and conservatives. But it's, it's almost an even conflict, whereas in, in, in the north, uh, in, in Canada, at present, it may change. but. Uh, the voices on, of the left and the left center are, are, are not being heard in the corridors of power. Uh, so my answer would be that the, that the differences are lessening between the two. Mm -hmm. I, I would just add to that that I think that um, the, the, the representation of this panel here suggests something about the, a much more connected sense amongst people, between people, than um, if you go to the larger political hierarchy. And it seems to me that one of the things that's being created partly because of the internet is indeed that those borders are not as strong, which isn't to say that the basic structures and political structures are not very determining. They are an American's uh, own um, interest in itself and lack of attention isn't very operative. But I think that they're more undermined now than they were 
Um, you were talking about the sameness and um, how we're responding to it, or how we should respond to it, and the poetic values that we have. Um, can you speak more on that, just on like what what your views are on like what should be changed or or maybe the same? You, you're talking to me? Uh, to, to George. To George. Oh, yeah. I, I wanted to get to that. Thank you. Um, yeah, let me give a very brief answer to that. What, If we're thinking about making it new at present, what might be the values that those who were making it new might hold to? Uh, and what would they be uh, reacting against, which, uh, which is a, gen a general character of, of poetry today? One thing that, that Steve said I think is in, uh, really important is that the future, the future is so foreshortened that uh, I don't think that, a, that a, a, I don't think that a future perspective is very compelling. But uh, irony, I would say that the that the great great character of that the the uh, unsatisfactory or the dis dispiriting character of so much contemporary poetry is irony. Irony meaning that the poet writes what what she writes, she doesn't really mean that. She means instead to convey some attitude of her own about those lines. And I think that the values that the value that would replace that would be some kind of straightforwardness or or realism uh, or sincerity. I was thinking of the word yes, sincerity, telling it like it is. The other thing, if I just add something about that too, is that I think the the field of poetry is a lot larger and more diverse than it was. Um, you know, so that in earlier times there might have been more more of a sense of oh, that's what those guys are doing over there. We can react to that and go over here. Um, you know, you just have to look at the the explosion of the education system and people exposed to poetry and creative writing programs and on and on and on and on. Uh, there's a lot more people writing poetry these days. It's harder to identify those, those riffs, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I was very interested to hear, especially the early part of the talk, in the discussion of all these influences, largely men and, and largely <laughs> white, white men. And Robert Duncan in 1976, who was uh, gay and out of the closet in the 40s and way ahead of his time in that respect, he told a class at UC San Diego in 1976, and it was captured in the uh, Lisa Jarno biography, uh, Ambassador for Venus. He said, I would have questions about any of the new minority movements simply because it seems to me that the whole issue of our time is that we barely hold on to writing as human beings, which is the hardest thing to do. To write as a woman, or to write as a man, or to write as a black, or to write as a gay poet is absolutely minor compared to with how do we hold this new human consciousness? Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of identity poetics and a lot of you know, the poets who are grouped according to their identity. H how do you reconcile the need for diversity with this notion that Duncan feels that maybe this limits us somehow when we identify in such a way? Mm -hmm. And this is just to anyone. Well, I think that you're absolutely right. I think that in, in a deeper sense, uh, the whole question of being human is under attack. Uh, that is, just give one aspect to it that the present age that we're in could be called the age of information, but a oh, quote of a line of T.S. Eliot's, how much knowledge have we lost in the name of information? And I think that that what is under threat now is not, it's not just a decline in reading, I believe there's, a, there's a, com a, a commensurate decline in thinking and that the process of, some, some psychologist or philosopher, and I can't remember who it was, he was responding to Jerry Fodor's idea that thinking was computation and he said, no, thinking to me is more like digestion in that you take something in and you change it in the human mind and it becomes your knowledge, but whereas I think there's a widespread view right now that knowledge is simply accumulated information outside the human mind. Uh, it's, it's, it's been said many, many ways, uh, uh, but like, like Michel Foucault used the phrase the death of man, meaning that, that in the 19th century people ceased to believe in God and now perhaps they're there's coming to disbelieve in man. 
or man in the, in, in the larger sense, meaning the human being. So yeah, I, I think that what is crucial is the human. Um, I think it's a really um, important and powerful question, and I think um, that many of us have, on the one hand, received definition from what you would call identity movements, and also actively worked against the ways that they, the categories tend to determine anything and everything that the category itself, woman or gay or whatever, seems to um, be the answer to the problem when in fact it's any of a number of, um, you might say, intersecting what I actually prefer to think of more as positionality than identity. And that I think one of the solutions always is working through that. How do you work from and through those identity movements? Uh, the call for diversity is particularly a, an institutional stronghold. Institutions grab things when they no longer seem dangerous. So indeed, yes, diversity is important. Attending to people's where they're coming from is important. But as the organizing category or understanding, it's problematic. So for instance, uh, where one of the places that I'm working right now is to see a mix of poets all as love poets, and that their first objective was to write love, even though they're writing love from different places and with different problematics. So um, sort of finding maybe what the universal category or paradigm might be, noting differences, difficulties, but not ending with those would be my sense. And also the sense, this constant need to reassure that there is a self. Uh, you, you don't mm -hmm. see people walking down the street where they are, they're connecting, uh, which in one way is, okay, we're all interconnected through our cell phones, through the internet, through this, but when you see there's a neediness to, to keep redefining yourself, am I really here? Mm -hmm. I'm here because somebody's, you know, I can contact somebody else. And that awesome. sense of being a, an, a, 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 a content individual, uh, I see us being in a very anxious uh, place right now. Um, I, just, I think we still uh, have something to work out uh, in terms of being able to think simultaneously uh, identity and difference, um, which is I think is part of the problematic is so where are we identical all, all as human beings, uh, but then where are there specific differences that have been produced and cultivated historically, and how, how, where do those need to be um, uh, acknowledged and respected and, and understood about what that difference is? Um, and not to you know, go back to the same topic again and again, again, but still, one way I think about climate change is we are all as human beings imperiled, but we are imperiled very differently. Um, and that has a lot to do with class and race and gender and where on this planet you live and all sorts of other things. Um, we're all in peril, but some are much more on the front line of, uh, in terms of that peril. Yes. Um, how do you see this innovation and this reaction against bringing the political and the personal together in the protecting of the bioregion as the, the rivers and waterways are replaced by these networks of roads and petrol ways? So how do we bring our political conscience and our social conscience together with the artistic, the aesthetic, the personal, in protecting this place? No, I think Steve. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, you know, my, my, I, I think about that problem a lot. And one of the first things I think is, well, a poem is never going to save anything. A poem's not going to do it. That's not the best tool to pick up um, to, to do social justice kinds of work. Nevertheless, uh, it's where I'm standing. It's what I do. Um, I, can't, I can't change much about that. Uh, and, and it does, in odd ways, find its way back in and, and, and function in interesting ways. So um, when people uh, come together to organize around an issue, people still like to have poetry to be part of that process. So I get asked to read at lots of rallies and on political occasions at demonstrations or to write things specifically for a rally or an occasion or an issue and come, would you give us a poem about blah, blah, blah. 
Um, so there's even like a piece of legislation written in a poem for Ralia. We need a poem on Bill C-38. You remember? <laughs> Maybe I can. I don't know. Um, so, you know, I, I'm kind of fascinated by, by this weird way where we still, as we try to do the, the political work we need to do, um, that we still see these kind of cultural problems. We still want someone to sing a song. We still want someone to read a poem. And if, 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 they're, if they're indigenous people who will drum and we can dance at the end, all the better. We, we want those parts of that, of that finding our connectivity and, and, and expressing our solidarity and, and you know, invigorating ourselves to do things together. Now, that was really just focusing on the, the cultural side of your equation. The bigger question, of course, I, I have not answered, and maybe we should we should halt on that. For Wait, now. stupid last question, and then we're going to get a wrap up. <laughs> yeah. so. you no, know, it just seems that the focus then is uh, not so much. We're not talking about the poem, but the poet. The poet is an exemplar, or the poet as uh, you know, as taking a philosophical, ethical position uh, wherever they go, and what they produce may be of a very, very incredibly, as we know. But I mean, that's what it. It seems to me, does this, uh, do you concur? Yeah, I, I think of Duncan, and, and uh, responsibility is the ability to respond. Mm -hmm. And then that's something that the poets have maybe always done. Uh, and we lose that sometimes, I think, and, and we, we enclose ourselves in these little spheres of aesthetic battles, for instance, and, and we lose track of that, that wider thing we might respond to and feel that kind of responsibility. I would just like to say I also think that one thing that hasn't been totally tapped or used is in fact the energy of poetry and arts communities themselves, not as sort of bastions of activism, but as people that are almost always interested and connected and committed to various political concerns. And so what are the, I mean, I think that actually the bifurcation of the artist community and the more political community um, is maybe some of the problem and that the poets and the artists need to see themselves as emanating from where they are from here, their location. Awesome, thank you guys.